He just liked kind of normal beer and Guinness and stuff like that. So we always used to bring over the most experimental beers for him to try. <laughs> and we knew we got it right when we invited him to take a, a sample of John Peel out of the tank. And he just, it, it came out luminous yellow yeah. with a head on the top of it that looked like whipped cream. <laughs> and he just took a sip of it and just went, oh. It's a bit thick. Yeah. <laughs> I looked at Ian and we're like, That's we got it. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> we got it. Hello and welcome to We Are Beer People, a podcast all about the many different people who help us enjoy beer. I'm your host, Rob Cadwell. And I reckon if you're listening to this, then there's a good chance that you are one of the beer people too. You might be involved in the world of beer. You may want to find out more about the industry, or perhaps you simply enjoy drinking the stuff. So join me now as I have a chat with one of the beer people. This is a story that begins with the welcome of the wood smoke. You know that feeling when you're out for a winter walk? You're in the countryside and it might be a bit cold or rainy, or you've been out walking for a while and are starting to feel the chill. But on the edge of the breeze, you catch a smell of wood smoke. And not long after that, you turn a corner and see in the distance a pub down the lane. A pub with a warm incandescent glow pouring from its windows into the street and a wisp of smoke reaching out from the roof to the sky. That right there is a siren song for the senses of what's to come. And at this point, it's practically a lost cause. You know you're going into the pub, and you can almost feel yourself being warmed by the thought of the welcome, the atmosphere, the food, drink, and the crackle of the fireplace. This might sound like a digression, and it's a little indulgent, but it is relevant, I promise. Because today's guest is Jamie Duffield, who you may know as JD. JD's the canning line lead at Siren Craft Brew, and he's previously been head brewer at Wild Weather. JD is known for innovating in beer styles, and he was recently involved at Siren making a cracking smoke porter called Fire and Stars, a lovely dark beer that truly evokes that welcome of the wood smoke. And JD describes himself as being interested in lots of things. Luckily for us, one of his many interests has been getting his head round brewing and packaging brilliant beers that we can enjoy. And we're going to hear all about JD's story of brewing foraging for spruce tips and here's a teaser i may have asked jd to play us out with one of his other interests so stay tuned for that we're recording this in the georgian dragon siren's countryside pub in swallowfield and yes the first thing i noticed was the smell of wood smoke when i arrived and when i entered the pub there was already a roaring fire ready to meet us For those that don't know you, uh, can you take us back to the beginning of your beer story? Why beer and what brought you here? Well, basically, I have this terrible affliction, which is that I'm interested in lots of things. And I really can't bear the idea of not knowing how something is made. Um, and I, I just can't leave things alone. Like, I don't sleep. <laughs> so just as with every young person, when they start trying alcohol and things like that, going out with their friends, I was probably one of the few people sat there drinking some beer going like, God, I've got to know how this stuff's made, though. And everyone else is just knocking it back. <laughs> um, and so and my, my house just ends up being full of books. And I, when I had more time, I just used to spend a lot of time reading about things and, and, and then telling my friends, much to their boredom, um, <laughs> and had a spell where I was doing sort of mechanical clocks and watches and taking them apart and putting them back together. And I bored the pants off my friends, just going like, oh, did you know about this type of escapement? Isn't it really interesting that it works this way? And they're like, no, it's not. Not to them anyway. Um, but I was fortunate enough, and I suppose this is the same story for lots of young people um, growing up when I did, uh, that my friends also happened to be interested in beer. So when I said, hey, did you know about this aspect of beer? They'd be like, huh, that is interesting, actually. And not only is it interesting, we want to start reading about it too. So all of my friends, my close friends anyway, of which I've kind of got three or four of them that I grew up with, we all started reading about beer. We all started having a go at making beer at the same time. And it became just a slightly different way of going out every weekend to do something to do with alcohol 
our going out every weekend to, to do stuff with alcohol was actually kind of the, the making of it mm-hmm. and the enjoying it and the sharing it afterwards. Yeah. So we had like a four-person homebrew club, basically unofficially. Um, so yeah, that, that was kind of the start of my beer journey. Um, I guess I have always just liked being in a situation where you've contributed in some way to somebody else's good time. And beer is definitely the vehicle for a good time, mm-hmm. traditionally so in, in the UK anyway. Uh, every weekend you'll see people out sharing a beer for some sort of occasion. And I'm a big believer in uh, not just occasional drinking, but drinking for occasion. And that doesn't mean like uh, a birthday celebration or a particular season, but the occasion might just be catching up with a friend. That's the mm-hmm. occasion. And so we're going to share a beer and there's kind of a bonding thing that happens with that. So I guess I'm just trying to say that I've got lots of really fond memories of doing things like that yeah. with beer when I was younger. And then uh, I guess you started off home brewing. How long were you home brewing before you were knocking at the door of uh, brewers and asking okay. to help? <laughs> I think there was probably a maybe a five-year period mm-hmm. where I was home brewing. I mean, I'll come out and say it straight away. My first home brews were awful. <laughs> <laughs> they were. I, I just didn't know enough. I was too too excited to get started, uh, and didn't really have the kind of the knowledge that I needed. And I started with the most basic. Yeah. kits and stuff these these days i i have to take my hat off to some of the home brewers that i know who go straight in and come out with a bang and go like ta-da yeah. lovely unoxidized hazy ipa and i go wow yeah like, that's... The, the laws of probabilities mean that has to happen I mean, sometime i guess but um, yeah it's happening more and more a lot a lot stacked against you isn't it i guess when you're doing that especially at home brew level where yes you can make beer but it will carry with it potential for off flavors and Ultimately, I just didn't really fully understand the basic principles yeah. of making beer when I first had a go at doing it. Yeah. Um, I, I brewed a batch of what I called rather a, a, a bit of an assumption, really. I called it Awesome Ale. That was just the name of the beer. I aim high. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. I, in the end, it ended up being like an ironic name, like Little John, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's... My, my dad said, well, he, he's got a bad experience of home brewing when he was a kid, so he doesn't want it in the kitchen because it will just explode everywhere. And I was like, yeah. well, okay, if you say so. So it's going out in the garage in the winter, too cold to ferment on yeah. ale yeast. I now know, know all of this now. Yeah. Uh, no no activity in the airlock, uh, no measurable change in the hydrometer. And I thought, well, but it's been two weeks. Well, you've got, got to bottle it, right? Yeah. Thank God it was plastic bottles. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I had a few bottle bombs, ended up kind of, well, plastic ones anyway, ended yeah. up venting those. Uh, and I forgot about a few in the garage and came back to them like three or four months later after I'd le- left the caps off slightly. And they'd basically done their primary fermentation in, in the yeah. bottle nice. on lots of different occasions. <laughs> and one or two of them were uh, like palatable yeah. but with a really thick yeast cake at the bottom of each bottle. Nice. Very gentle pour on those. Uh, or, or not, if you don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I was like, hey, this actually looks great. Oh. <laughs> it's so clear. Yeah, I, I only did that with one. I then went to, to university in Reading, which is mm-hmm. kind of leads on to why I'm here, still in Reading now. And I was studying to be a primary school teacher with an art specialism. So half of my degree was um, in the studio, and half of it was doing placements at four different primary schools. The, the idea being is that rather than a PGCE where you do a degree and then decide, I want to do the kind of add-on that makes me a teacher, your degree is actually focused on primary teaching from the very beginning. So sadly, that degree course doesn't exist anymore. We were BA Ed students, so we would arrive on the scene as specialists in our subject with four years of good knowledge, Mm -hmm. learning everything from learning disabilities um, to how to support gifted children and, and things like that. And, you know, I got to the end of my degree and during my spare time, I had been working uh, part time behind the bar at the Ale House in Reading. Mm-hmm. And then I was the cellar manager at the Castle Tap for a little while. Um, after that, I got involved in Reading Beer Festival. I ended up running the university's Real Ale Society yep. and changing that from a, a group that only had about five or six members, only just enough to be technically called a society. And when I, when I left, uh, we had more than 50 and attracted lots of international students who would come and want to know about British beer because if you come from a place where it's only lager, yeah. all of the cask taps and things like that uh, were really interesting to them. So 
And yeah, I, I look back on it now and go like, well, it was called the Real Ale Society, but realistically, we were kind of the the home brewing and pub appreciation society. We weren't necessarily all ale drinkers because some of them were interested in how to make lager. So in a way, I look back and go, like, I wish we'd have changed the name. Mm-hmm. But it was quite heavily associated with camera back yeah. then. And I, I don't think they would <laughs> like yeah. that. Certainly not call it the Craft Beer Society. They wouldn't have been, been interested. So I finished my degree. Um, and I think sometime in the last year of that degree, I decided that actually back then, I think I still had more to be excited about and more to learn about other things and wasn't ready to start teaching other people other things mm-hmm. long term as a career and go, right, that's it. Not to say you can't learn more stuff as a teacher, but it's a busy job and it will take up a lot of your life. My, my wife knows that. She, she did do exactly that and I met her on that course and is, she's still a teacher now. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't have a lot of time for hobbies and interests and yeah. I'm always a big hobbies and interests guy. So you're probably making up for two there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely. Like I said, this terrible affliction where I'm interested in too many things. Yeah. Um, so I said to her that once we graduated, I would like to have a go at becoming a brewer. Uh, at the time, I just couldn't imagine something more exciting. You know, you wake up and go, I can't believe I'm being paid to do this. Yeah. But without industry experience beyond working in pubs and bars, you kind of had to prove yourself in another way. And, and that was with beer knowledge, um, personal skills, those mm. sorts of things. And when you do work behind the bar, you have the opportunity to meet a lot of brewers, especially a place like the Ale House where they are interested in coming in and, and sharing a beer with you, those, yeah. those sorts of things. So I met uh, Chris Bingham through that and applied for a job there and just said, I'd, I mean, I actually applied for a job at all sorts of different breweries. I applied for a job at Siren at the same time. Oh, yeah. I applied for a job at Wild Weather at the same time. Yeah. And Bingham's was just the first one that got back to me and said, actually, we have an assistant brewer's position coming up. It doesn't pay much, but we've got somebody moving on um, and you can take their role. And I was like, yep. Yeah, I know, I'm yeah. great. <laughs> I'm still, I think at this point, I'm, uh, you know, only just um, moving in with my now wife. We Rent back then was not what it is these days, so I could afford to, uh, to become a brewer while she laboured away in the classroom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what great fun those really first few years. Really cool. And that was that Bingham's that was near Twyford? That's right. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was really fortunate uh, to sort of land there and a few months later the brewery won champion beer of Britain for its vanilla stout. Yeah. Um, I can't take any credit for that myself. I, I had a hand in the, the care of that beer, of those recipes. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is all, um, you know, the previous team's work, and I kind of joined on at the right time yeah. for that. But yeah, we really saw us kind of being catapulted to only making vanilla stout for, <laughs> for six months yeah. of the year, uh, which is great fun. The curse of success there. Yeah. yeah. It was a great beer. Yeah. Really, it was a great beer. And... Um, I'm still good friends with everybody that I worked with there. Um, you know, the the team at the time was was John Wellat, who who now is the head brewer at Disruption, mm-hmm. and Ian Morris, who's the head brewer at Electric Bear now. So, yeah. at one stage, all three of us were head brewers, <laughs> and uh, Chris decided to take a, a step out of the industry for his own reasons, and now is more of a, a professional appreciator of beer. I think. <laughs> That's fair enough. You definitely. There's yeah. lots to appreciate, isn't there? Oh, definitely. Yeah, we can agree yeah. on that one. Yeah, but a big, big thanks to all those guys because they they were my they were my leg up. They they were my my in. So with a few home brews uh, beneath your belt, and I guess immersing yourself in beer culture, pubs, cellars, and all that sort of stuff. What kind of things were you having to pick up as an assistant brewer? I mean, it, it's everything from packaging. So Bingham's was a hundred percent cask and the occasional bottle. Mm-hmm. Although we did contract bottle, um, it's kind of cask washing. Uh, cleaning, all, all of the really important jobs that are the less glamorous ones. Those are the ones that you start out with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you uh, you soon show an interest for the recipe development side of things and for the actual beer production side of things as well. And so in the end, you're running the brew kit on your own mm-hmm. when needed to. Yeah. As well. So you ended up in a small team where you've only got three or four people. Uh, you do have to do everything um, except for deliveries, in, in my case anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's that's what I was doing there. Excellent. Oh, brewery tours as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, some of my favourite things to do. Yeah, no, I went on a Bingham's brewery tour, I think, once, and, yeah. and get your jug of beer and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, really good. Yeah, that is a really nice one. The, the Bingham's brewery tour was nice and simple as well. You just you just walked in, sat, yeah. sat at the brew kit, and were sort of had a conversation with 
whoever was doing the tour while one of the other assistants came out and just kept filling you glass up yeah, with beers what's not to like yeah, at that yeah, point. yeah yeah i remember sitting there and again that was probably quite early on in my beer journey and um probably for the first time being able to see end to ends like what a brew kit looks like yeah and being able to appreciate it right it goes in here it goes here it goes here and understanding that process yeah whereas before you might have looked at a big brewery and gone i don't know yeah shrug at that or it's sort of i don't know too small but it was like a really good size to mm. understand all of that that size of brewery is it, it makes you realize the the step from home brewing to pr- production brewing uh you're always looking for three pots, aren't yeah. you? This is what I used to say on tours. Look, look for three pots. Yeah. One pot's got hot water in it. One pot you put the grain in with the hot water. The other pot, it gets boiled. Then there's other vessels for, for maturation and fermentation and things like yeah. that. But those those three pots are in all breweries. Yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes they're upstairs with one pot upstairs, one pot in the middle and one pot in the basement. They're really cool breweries if you get to see those. Yeah. Um, and then in the case of places like Siren, uh, all of the pots are on a deck where you've got to climb up a... And stand on a gantry to look into them yeah and even in some even bigger breweries you've got some pots which are in a whole different room yeah you know <laughs> so but there's still three pots well it's full yeah. and like yeah. their pots are kind of sunk into the fabric yeah. of the building so you can only see the top of the pot but then you look in and go like hell that's deep <laughs> that's it and you get breweries like that where they've got like a command center yeah where you run the brew day from you're not sort of where you know yeah, literally like digging out the uh <laughs> The stuff, are you? And all that. Yeah. So it depends how hands-on you are for yeah. a particular brewery. But yeah. I guess that's all the thing that brings the your differences and nuances to your kit and your brew day as well of how, how that works. So how long were you at uh, Bingham's for before you moved on? Um, I think it was just less than two years. Um, and that, that came as... I, I've always enjoyed making new recipes. And that's what I was doing as a home brewer. I was always I wasn't necessarily refining and repeating the same thing over and over again. And some that's fair enough for some people. That's just not what I was doing at the mm-hmm. time. I have always enjoyed experimenting with different uh, flavors and ingredients and making beers that people will pick one up and go like, "Oh wow, I didn't. That, that's that's mm-hmm. crazy. That's this is, this is great. How have you done this? <laughs> like magic trick beer, yeah. you know? Like <laughs> uh, so, like white stout was always like a fun personal favorite of mine to brew at home because the whole idea that you could shut your eyes and smell coffee and chocolate put the beer to your lips and it's kind of creamy and full-bodied and you open your eyes and you go ta-da it's pale yeah. <laughs> <Psych>. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and i don't know it's just like a silly gag but yeah. I, I like it because bingham's was a traditional brewery that made a like a pale bitter a traditional bitter uh, an ipa mm and variations on a theme for stout. Although they did do like monthly specials, these were, once again, traditional styles. You'd do like a smoke porter or a winter warmer, those sorts of things. And there just wasn't, there wasn't really room in the repertoire from a business standpoint to do heavily dry hopped beers. We didn't have the equipment to do that. We didn't, and also the business wouldn't have been right for that either. So I, over the time I was there, just sort of, gradually got to the stage where I felt like I wanted to do more experimental things. Mm-hmm. And Bingham's, through no fault of their own, wasn't the right place for that. And, uh, and so I ended up talking to Siren again and, and Wild Weather again and uh, a few other breweries as well uh, that I knew were making experimental beers. And the most experimental of them all uh, got back to me and said, yeah, all right, we'll, we'll take you on. We have an assistant brewer's role coming up. Yeah, let's let's do that. So I ended up feet on the ground at Wild Weather, which back then was known locally as probably one of the most goofy, wacky <laughs> <laughs> uh, breweries for for the sorts of styles they kicked out. Uh, you know, they they had like a, a chocolate milk stout in their core range at the mm. time, and yeah. I guess when you think back to that, like now that's quite commonplace that a brewery might have that, but back then that yeah. was there weren't many places doing that. I think we were starting to get, you know, the start of the UK craft beer scene and hoppy mm-hmm. beers and all of that, but not quite maybe the full range of pastry stouts and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, they were definitely ahead of their time with, with Ian Clark there pushing the um, the kind of crazier side of things. Uh, they were had a very individual, uh, unique kind of character to them. And from from the guys that I'd met who already worked there, uh, they seemed like the right fit for me as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, back back then when Mike Tempest was running the place, he always liked to start early and finish early. Um, and so my first brew day, I was there at like 5.30 a.m. Uh, 
but like excited. Like, yeah. like, yeah. Kind of enthusiastic. Up, yeah, got yeah. up at four in the morning, like, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's always good, yeah. Yeah. So what was a, a typical day like for wild weather? Well, when I first started, it, it was not too different from the sort of operations you were doing at Bingham's Brewery, but we had collaborations coming in, stuff like that. Uh, I think day one, we had a collab with Weird Beard, and that was my first opportunity to kind of meet another brewer from another brewery Mm -hmm. and make beer together, which was cool. Then even the first week, we had Yeasty Boys in for a collab as well, and I I still talk to all of these people now. You know, it just shows that making beer with other people is a real bonding experience and because you, you tend to go out for a pint and some food afterwards and chat chat to each other. Uh, you know, you talk exactly as, as we're talking now, yeah. except they've got their own beer story as well. Definitely has echoes of your first experiences yeah. with home brewing and brewing together with your friends. Yeah. But now you're doing it at, a, mm. I guess, a brewery level. Yeah. So I was, I think I was there for uh, six years on the dock mm-hmm. and three years, just less than three years as, as assistant brewer yeah and um and just more than three years as the head brewer there and my my role there i started to take on a lot of the operations stuff as well and things like the staffing um but there was recipe design it was doing meet the brewers it was doing a lot of production it was doing a lot of training as well of new staff and trying to be that leg up for them that that people like johnny and chris were Mm -hmm. for me um and thankfully a good number of them are still in the industry uh, even though wild well, weather's not there, sadly, <laughs> anymore. Um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to pay that forwards. But it was a busy time. Um, really, really busy, really exciting place to work when we were in our heyday there. Yeah. Um, what were your kind of favourite brews that you made at, at Wild Weather? There must be a few there. Uh, it's some, I mean, Wild Weather definitely had its own character and vibe. Mm-hmm. And my favourite brews are the ones where... Uh, you see people smirking when they're talking about them, <laughs> you know, either because they, for their time, were like really strong, but very palatable. Yeah. So that, I mean, when I first joined, they already had this recipe in the bank, but like things like Skadoosh, oh, which yeah. was an 11% tipper before anybody else was knocking on the door of yeah. 8% in the, oak, in the local area. Yeah. But it was just, it was so uh, like sneaky and drinkable that, that people would get skadooshed. They, they would have a can and go like, oh, that was nice. I might yeah. start on another one. And they'd get a few sips in and they'd be like laying on the floor. <laughs> Trying to stand up. For that yeah. Point, yeah. And, you know, obviously that I'm, I'm not advocating irresponsible drinking, but that's, that was just a one funny aspect of things. Um, but, yeah, where, wherever there was a smirk to be seen about a recipe, mm. whether that was – did, we did a cockle and seaweed stout once, which yeah. was a really hard sell. The, the slowest moving beer in for the sales <laughs> team that we'd ever produced – but by God, it was delicious. Yeah. Yeah, there was this, I mean, you take, imagine a bit like an oyster stout, but with a bit more kind of a briny, kind of chocolatey, full-bodied vibe. It was really nice. We even had like fans of Wild Weather who were buying cases of it to turn it into gravy for pies. Oh, really? Yeah, it worked so well, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we brewed a beer. I mean, probably the most infamous beer that, that I had a kind of direct hand in making there was what was called John Peel when it first came out, mm-hmm. um, which was a banana milkshake IPA. It was basically ignoring the style guideline for milkshake IPA, which should be kind of, you know, hop focused and, and pushing the kind of tropical yeah. ripe mango vibes and, the, and then taking the word milkshake far too literally and yeah. going like, I remember milkshakes from when I was a kid. <laughs> you know, the banana yeah. milkshake IPAs like Yazoo yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, let's make one of those. Yeah. Uh, banana foam <clears throat> type flavours. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Like foam banana flavors and and lots of real banana. So we, that one, I just wanted to hit the uh, the two groups of people who know about banana milkshake, which is your sort of Yazoo drinker, mm-hmm. but also your I want to use ice cream and real vanilla and real banana in a kind of the American diner uh, banana milkshake yeah, style. Yeah, yeah. And then make sure that both those groups of people were happy with the one beer. So you used elements of both. So there was like the iso acetate type banana milkshake flavoring in that beer as well as lots of natural banana for uh, like full body and stuff like that yeah yeah we we used to use our our next door neighbor at wild weather who was a metal worker an old metal worker called jeff as a bit of a sounding board yeah and, and a tasting he, panel yeah but he he just liked kind of normal beer and guinness and stuff like that so we always used to bring over the most experimental beers for him <laughs> to try <laughs> And we knew we got it right when we invited him to take a, a sample of John Peel out of the tank. And he just, it, it came out like luminous yellow yeah. with a head on the top of it that looked like whipped cream. <laughs> and he just took a sip of it and just went, 
oh, it's a bit thick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I looked at Ian and we're like, that's praise indeed yeah, from got Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> we got it. If Jeff, think, if Jeff thinks it's a bit thick, then yeah. it's, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've hit the mark here. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, I had a great time working there. It That's good. good. It sounds like wild weather would have scratched that itch for having many hobbies. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, underneath all the silliness, you have to bear in mind that if you're the head brewer there, you have, you have to make it work at the same time. You can't, you can't pull off a beer like that without having really meticulously studied exactly how you might do it. Yeah. And lots, lots of people used to ask me, oh, do you brew pilot batches? Believe me, if I'd had a pilot kit there, I would have used it. We just didn't have one. Yeah. So I had so to this be... Is, this is the pilot batch. Yeah, bit. I just had to be super confident uh, that, that the information I had gained in figuring out the nuts and bolts of that recipe was going to work. Mm-hmm. And more often than not, they were built off previous recipes. So you weren't going in like completely blind. Um, that That is one of the misconceptions, I think, of... of uh, when, when people imagine brewing experimental beer, they imagine that you're starting completely blind. But if you've baked a cake before and you're going to make a different flavoured cake this time, they're all cakes. You know the basics of making cakes. If you don't make the cake that you were intending, fair enough. Mm-hmm. It will still be cake. It will probably still be nice because you know what makes it not nice. Yeah. <laughs> and barring anything unexpected happening, you'll always end up with a, a nice beer uh, at the end of it. And people often said, like, oh, did you intend for it to turn out this way? Occasionally, the answer was, no, but it's really nice, though, isn't it? We've just changed the, the marketing around it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It has to be flexible on those yeah. ones. Our homebrew club is there's a phrase about, it'll still be beer. It might not be as intended, but you'll still have beer at the end that you can drink and enjoy. Yeah, I used to say, it's still a data point. That's it. You'll learn from that, and you'll yeah. uh, go on and iterate. And If you've pushed the envelope out so far, it's it's out the window. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then you have a very wide net of data points to, it, to yeah. pull different silly things from. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so you're six years at Wild Weather, and yeah. then obviously, unfortunately, Wild Weather closed down and moved yeah. from its location. Mm. Um, and then you moved to Siren. Yeah. So you'd been in touch with them before, of course, about them. But mm. can you tell us a little bit about your time at Siren and how you got started there? Yeah. I mean, Siren's an interesting story because they, they've been going for as long as Wild Weather had been going, mm. really, at the time. Uh, and I remember drinking my first Siren beers at Reading Beer Festival when they came out with, I think it was Soundwave and Undercurrent they had on on cask there, stillaged up in Reading Beer Festival. And they blew me away. The, the, they were so hoppy compared to everything else there, and they were absolutely different from from all of the other range. And I thought, wow, this is, this is a brewery to watch at that time. And I've been watching them ever since, yeah. you know, e- even from Wild Weather. Uh, I've I've been watching what Siren do. I've I've bought their beers. I've been excited about their releases. I've stayed across their social media, attended a couple of their events just as a fan, you know. And through doing that occasionally, uh, I've ended up meeting some of the people who work there. Um, and there was one, I think we did a joint tap takeover uh, at the Rake in London. Mm-hmm. And Sean Knight happened to be there, the, the the now head brewer at Siren, I think shortly after he'd just joined. Yeah. And we ended up sharing a beer and having a chat and things like that. And I didn't realise how significant that would be because I, I hadn't forgotten about it. I just didn't realise the importance to him because he, he got an idea of who I was. He told me that there wasn't a, a, an option to come into the brew team at the moment, but if I wanted a job at Siren, there's this canning line operator job that he's been struggling to fill. And I kind of scratched my head about that because although we, we did do canning at Wild Weather, the machine was a lot smaller, a lot more manual. And because I was doing the head brewer role and a bit of ops, uh, that kind of the canning side of thing had been a bit delegated out to other members of the team. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't really in charge of that, although I operated the machine. I wasn't, um, I wasn't setting the seams or doing any repair work on it in the way that we are now. Um, so... Like I said, interested in lots of things, and there are very few things that I'm not interested in. I just thought to myself, well, I've got a big opportunity here, really, to to learn a lot very quickly about how big production canning works. And there's interest to be found in that because it's an incredible machine to behold yeah. once it's really going. It's churning out 6,000 cans an hour 
when we're on 330s and it's just a blur, you know, a big rotating manifold. It's kind of a Goliath of yeah. a machine. Um, I always find those mesmerizing. Very yeah. satisfying about watching a line running well. I just, you know, wish but, that yeah, it, it was that without but, my but, inputs. But they're, they're so complicated, aren't they? And yeah, there's they so are. many things happening. So I guess you had to learn all about that and how they work and yeah. how to troubleshoot it and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah, I was transparent with Sean. I basically told him that I would put my best foot forward. Uh, he he was quite keen in having somebody with a lot lot of brewing background in that role mm-hmm. because things like oxidation is a big deal. Uh, it's a big it's 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 important to get right and if you come from a brewing background then you have an appreciation for the product that's in the can I think you do get a lot of people that apply for kind of canning roles who come not from brewing but from other canning positions so whether they're doing like beans or sodas or or it doesn't matter you know Uh, the machines are quite similar Uh, so having that head on my shoulders I was I, I think just able to even do kind of sensory check the beer in a way that your usual canning person wouldn't. Yeah. Um, so not that I find any off flavours in them, but I could. Mm-hmm. I could do that. Um, and I think early detection of anything like that is going to mm. save so much time, money, beer, yeah. all those sorts of things if you can do that. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, it's strange. There, there was so much to learn so quickly that I just had to jump in with both feet. I... I, I dug out the manuals for all of the machines we had in that room and I took them home for like bedtime reading. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Like, my, my colleague at the time, David, was like, yeah, that's very impressive, but like, what are you doing? Like taking the manuals yeah. home, man. <laughs> like, get a life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but ultimately then I'd, you'd come in the following week and in any downtime I would walk around the machines with the manuals open and sort of compare the technical drawings and go like, Oh, that's what that is. That's what that does. Mm. That's so. Then, I mean, it's helped massively when it comes to troubleshooting. So, like, if ever you're working on new machinery, I I, I hate to feel ignorant about it. I, I hate to just kind of watch it run and when something doesn't go right, uh, call someone else. Although that is what you do have to do when you're dealing with expensive machinery. You can't just jump in and go, "I know how to fix this." Yeah, <laughs> but at least you, you might know where to start. I guess you might even say, "I've seen something that doesn't look right because yeah. it didn't look right in." You know, it didn't look like this yesterday, and I know yeah. what that bit is. So, even just to have some verbal input and say, "How about checking this?" or "Have we looked at that?" Yeah. Um, is a useful thing. And you know, we're we're sort of nine months into that journey, canning at Siren now, and I feel really kind of comfortable. I wish I could say that I'd seen every problem that there can be, <laughs> and yet, like I was just showing our new lead brewer the box maker uh, machine the other day, and like first box came through some problem with the machine. I was like, oh, I've never seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this never happens to me. But he saw me troubleshoot it, mm-hmm. and he goes, oh, so that's how you troubleshoot. Yeah. And it turned out not to be what I thought it was. Uh, okay, and yeah. not to be, not, it wasn't even anything that had happened in like the, the last year. <laughs> Just, oh, yeah. Nice, yeah. Um, but I guess you've then had the opportunity to uh, brew as well at Siren. Yeah. Uh, so far, I, I, have, I haven't led a brew myself because the kit is really different to the stuff mm-hmm. I've worked with before. The concepts and all of the knowledge I have in, in my head is still there, but the actual procedural knowledge is what I don't yet have. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you could say like, oh, well, I've driven vehicles before, but it doesn't necessarily mean you would be really good at driving a lorry. Yeah. It's a bit like that. Um, but because the team at Siren know what my background is, uh, I am being brought into recipe development conversations and not just brought in, but encouraged to say, look, if you've got an idea, share it with us. If you see something that you think we could change with our procedure, share it with us, justify it, explain your thoughts. We want to hear from you. So it's a really encouraging environment. That's brilliant, that. yeah. It's yeah. really refreshing to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, I know Sean is working really hard to instill that in people, to, to make it easier for people to put ideas forwards. And so I thought, okay... I'll throw a few ideas into the wind and just email him a few concepts that I had going around my head because mm-hmm. they don't stop. Even when you're not production brewing, you still wake up in the night and go, oh, smoke pour. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're enjoying our chat. And if you like what you're hearing, there are a few things you can do that will really help us out and help other people find the podcast. Number one, follow or subscribe to We Are Beer People podcast wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review or rating. Number two, share the episode on your socials or even in actual real life. And if you want to stay up to date with all things We Are Beer People, you can visit our website, which is wearebeerpeople.co.uk, 
where you can sign up for a monthly newsletter and you can follow us on social media at we are beer people all one word and if you have any questions or comments or want to hear from any particular beer people send me a message via the website or on social media now back to the podcast And the smoke porter, Fire and Stars, is the is the beer that I that I can say kind of that that I have led. I I have I I, I wrote the grist for it. Sean put the nuts and bolts together in terms of how it would work through our system, uh, and I also smoked a portion, not a massive portion, but an, a portion of our own malt over the uh, used Caribbean chocolate cake spirals. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I honestly, I smoked myself as much as I smoked <laughs> that because I was doing it in a tower smoker yeah. and in batches. I was out there for the best part of nine hours. Yeah. Yeah. I had uh, my pillow that I sleep on at home still smelt of smoke after th- after I'd gone for three showers. Wow. And it was just, it was everywhere, like in my beard that I had at the time. I warned Emily, I said, yeah. I'm quite smoky and my car is going to be quite <laughs> smoky for a little while after yeah. that. And I think even she she was surprised at how smoky I was. I yeah. walked into the tap yard at lunchtime midway through the smoking session. I was stood at the bar for less than 30 seconds before somebody went, is something on fire? <laughs> and I was like, it's me. Just me. Yeah. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a good one. The interesting thing about Fire and Stars is that in a, in a brewery like Siren, where you've got a, a schedule to keep to and vacancies within it for specials, yeah. Um, the sales team also have an idea of what kinds of beers they want to sell. It's not quite the same where, well, whether you could just 100% invent it yourself and then present that to the sales team and say, this is, this is what mm-hmm. we have going on in our minds. Um, I had originally suggested to Sean a much bigger beer, Imperial Strength, yep. with other elements in it, uh, one of which was smoke. And he said, well, that, I really like that. Let's, let's kind of put a pin in that. We do have an opening in our kind of special schedule for something a bit like that but it's got to be a bit weaker and let's strim it down to so we're just working with smoke mm. so smoke porter like take that away and rework it and I was like okay I like I like this yeah, this, nice. this is how a big brewery works you know you can't just be silly all the time you have to yeah. <laughs> nice bit of direction as well there yeah. to, to yeah. go with that and I guess being aware of that pipeline that you need to fill that customers want mm-hmm. and all of that and how your involvement in that yeah so this is where I think for me, my brewing journey, I, I wouldn't like to say I'm losing my silly side, um, <laughs> but it's maturing. It's maturing and I'm really getting to grips with how a brewery of that calibre puts out such good beer all the time. Um, I want to talk about hats, if you don't mind. <laughs> okay. Um, but in your roles, uh, if you look back at Bingham's Wild Weather and Siren, how would you describe that? Because I guess you might have had different hats at Wild Weather mm. and you know different hats at Siren. <laughs> Yeah, well, weather with the small team, it, it, obviously I was wearing the, the brewing hat a lot, but you also wear the public hat a lot because you don't have an events team, mm-hmm. which we do at Siren. So you're, the, you're in a sense, you're the customer facing side. Uh, you are the, a bit of the sales side because people walk in and want to buy beer and they kind of don't care if you're busy. <laughs> like, um, you also don't want to make them feel like they can't be served because you're busy. So there are definitely times where we've gone home late because somebody has come in and said, yeah, can I get like 10 litres of beer? And you're like, yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> and you put on that smile and go, yeah, of course you can, mate. Like, definitely. Um, so while weather, I was constantly changing hats. Mm-hmm. Um, and because they were constantly changing, they were quite shallow hats, berets, yep. if you will. <laughs> Think, things... Fashionable sometimes. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I didn't really have the big moustache to go with the beret. No, but I mean, that was not <laughs> I did true, feel like guess, that a lot yeah. of the time. Yeah. Uh, that was a Mythbusters joke, yeah. not a slight on French people. No. <laughs> <laughs> and at Siren, I'm far more often wearing the canning hat. Uh, I am sometimes wearing the recipe development hat, which is nice. Uh, but that's a very small hat. Like, you know, I don't know, what's a small hat? A fascinator, maybe. <laughs> nice little, yeah, nice little clip-on thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, One of those tennis visors or something yeah, like that. Or croupiers sort of hat. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And then a bit of a top hat for canning. Yeah, that's that's the deepest hat of them all. So my, my job is a bit more specific at the moment. Excellent, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting Victorian images in my head at this point. Well, it's a very traditional career. That's, yeah. that's another thing that's always attracted me to, to brewing is that, especially in this day and age where you've got so much work from home, I mean, that wasn't the case 
when I first started, but it definitely is now. Mm. Lots of people who work in nondescript IT who don't particularly want to talk about their jobs because they themselves find them not exciting. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've always liked the idea of having your hands in, in it, you know, and uh, doing something which has been done in the UK for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years has always been brewers. Is it a bit like how I'd imagine a carpenter feels, yeah. you know? Yeah, except you can't then drink the chair they've made. That's disappointing, but you can enjoy a nice sit down after, sit a, long, after a long day of brewing. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I often sometimes think about that when I'm looking at like walls and bricks and things like that. You think at some point someone or a group of people have built that, yeah. created that, they've literally had their hands on that. And I don't know, what was that person doing at the time? Those are exactly the kind of questions I, I ask myself about all sorts of things like that. My, my wife is forever rolling her eyes at me because if ever we're sat somewhere for more than a minute, I'm looking around at the brickwork and going like, this building wasn't originally this high. <laughs> look, there's a different line of bricks. Hang on, what, and what was that? There, look. Why have they bricked up that? Why is there a doorway up there? And then you start looking at the floor and going like, well, it's either been paved. Up. Oh, look, no, hang on, look, there's a post. <laughs> You're like pulling back the curtain yeah, that yeah. no one asks you to pull back. Too many years of watching Time Team when I was a kid. That's it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't look in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you mentioned your, your wife, but how, um, how have you balanced kind of family life with brewing at the different stages mm. that uh, you've gone through? Becoming an adult has been really difficult for me because now we have a child as well. I I never really appreciated the drain on my spare time it would. And I've always been the kind of person that uses up all of their spare time for all manner of hobbies and interests. And to be honest, if you're going to work hard at work and be a good husband and a good dad, your hobbies and interests, they just have to take a back seat for a little while. Mm -hmm. So I don't play as much music as I wish that I could. I don't do as much fitness and exercise stuff as I wish I could. But, you know, my job is a priority of mine and my family are the top priority. So I don't feel like uh, I'm being shortchanged there because, mm -hmm. you know, Robin's as rewarding as he is a pain. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on the day. Yeah. <laughs> he gives and he takes. He, yeah. he, he does yeah. give and take. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah, coming to terms with being an adult. I don't know if I'll ever fully come to terms. I, kind of looking forward to retirement so I can pick up all my <laughs> hobbies and interests again. <laughs> looking to the future, yeah. I, think, I don't know. I don't speak to anyone who think, feels like they're an adult yet. or mm, We're all just older children. Just get older and creakier, I think, as we go. Oh, definitely creakier yeah. now, yeah. And that is the chairs creaking in the background, not, not us, I think, at the moment, <laughs> or at least not yet anyway. You mentioned you sort of started off training as a teacher mm -hmm. as well when you got into that. Do you think any of those skills and experiences have you know, helped you on your journey? Mm, definitely. And I even felt like it was helping me while I was behind the bar at the Ale House and the Castle Tap and, and, and to an extent Reading Beer Festival. Is this whilst you're sort of disciplining all the people? <laughs> no, yeah, you know what, like you have to be a hard line with some people, but like telling somebody off in the pub and, and get, getting them to leave isn't always the right thing to do because they're, they're probably never going to come back and they might be embarrassed or whatever. It's, 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 it's a hard line to tread, but... You are forced into effectively a full-time public speaking engagement when you're training as a teacher because not only do you have to present to your uh, class while you're doing classwork, you have to present to your tutors and you have to present to your peers as well. You are always up. And, and, and in uh, the art studio side of things, you're always presenting mm -hmm. for, for your group criticals. If you can't talk about your work, you can't just leave it up to other people's interpretation. They have to know what the thought of the artist was behind yeah. those different things. So I wasn't always a big public speaker type of person until I went to university and did those things. And in my, my personality behind the bar, uh, I see myself, especially somewhere... I mean, I actually did, and it reminded me of this the other day, I did a, a guest shift back at the Ale House just mm -hmm. last weekend. I, I'd forgotten how much I loved it. Because my favourite type of customer to interact with is somebody who's never been in before, who sees too many beers, wants to have a nice beer and wants to have a nice time, but doesn't quite know how and can be intimidated by a big list. Mm -hmm. So you disarm them and just go like, hey, I see you're looking a little bit confused. I'm here to help. I've tasted these beers at the start of my shift. What sort of thing are you looking for, pale or dark? And then you start being more specific from that kind of thing. So you're almost giving that kind of customer the pastoral care 
yeah. uh, making them relax. And, you know, they've come into your pub because they want to have a relaxing drink or something like that. And you're facilitating that. Mm. They will be better off for your advice on it. And they may even decide uh, to have something on your recommendation that they would not have gone for. And you broaden their horizons. And then they come back and say, oh, I, I really enjoyed interacting with that member of the bar staff there. So like, that's definitely one of my favorite things to do and definitely a benefit of, of gaining that public speaking side uh, and that trying to understand the other person. Because you know, kids misbehave a lot, but they're misbehaving because they think they're doing the thing that either they want to do or they think they're doing the right thing. And seeing why they're doing certain things and coming to them from their perspective, you can do it with adults too because ultimately when you're at 5 to 11 yeah. and everybody's had five <laughs> or six pints, yeah. it's a little bit like managing a class of children. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's why people do it. You know? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Could you tell us some of your all-time favourite beers? Uh, yeah, so this year we had a beer by Hop Butcher called Extra Green Neon Relish, which... I love the name of that. Yeah, that. well, yeah. It was in a big green can with a cartoon can of pickles on the front. Big uh, tick. Yeah, mm-hmm. and yeah, Hop Butcher, they're a brewery in Chicago, so... It is really difficult to get hold of their beer in the UK as fresh as we had it. And we just, it was jackpot. Complete potluck. We went into uh, a bottle shop in Bristol and picked one up. And you never really know with American beers how well they've travelled over here. Because I've I've been let down a couple of times when we've had imported beers that have been stored warm, even for a short period. um, And they they kind of lose their shine. You, You could have cracked that beer in the kitchen downstairs and I'd have smelt it in the attic instantly. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. it just filled up one of those huge hop aroma, kind of, it was an 11% Citroen Sabro triple IPA oh. and it just came out uh, I mean, I, I've worked with cans now for long enough that I feel like I can sort of, I can even see oxygen you know, because yeah. even that t- tiny little tinge of grey or brown, you're like oh, okay, that's probably 10, 15, 20 PPB <laughs> <laughs> You know, so, got in yeah. there at some point. To ensure your eyes yeah. soon. And it was just looked like custard. Oh. And I loved it. It had such a powerful kind of aroma presence that even while it was in your mouth, before you'd swallowed it, it was coming out of your nose and your ears and your eyes. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And then, like, like a Vix or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Like, uh, for some people, that experience is probably too intense. But I'm a bit of a sensation seeker myself. And this is kind of why I, I followed the craft beer line more so than the traditional beer line because i don't know whether you start to lose your sense of sensation seeking whether you when you're making the same product over and again it's a different kind of pride mm-hmm. you know uh you you listen to podcasts where you're talking to pilsner urkel uh, and and um uh budvar and stuff like that and they really take pride on the fact that their recipe hasn't changed and is the same yeah. and they get such a kick out of that um for me like i'm always looking for something to kind of to yeah, latch onto next. to see where you can go with the yeah. ingredients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For for moving things along or mm. changing them around or making, you know, that's why that's why artists are still making new songs now rather than all folding up their computers and going, "There's enough good songs yeah. out there." Well, there's, there's already <laughs> the same notes, the same chords, yeah, and yeah. everything. Yeah, and yeah. there's still new things to be done with music too. But yeah, this this particular beer really stood out to me. Uh, it, it quite literally blew my head off, and it was so pungent that even after you'd finished it, I didn't want to eat anything. Because I was still sort of, the in, inside of my head was saturated with citra and sabro, and I was just there breathing in and out of my nose, like... <gasps> like hyperventilating. <laughs> well, trying to breathe slowly as well, so I didn't yeah. waste it. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's really nice. Yeah, so yeah. every now and then you'll get a beer that, like, blows your pants off like that. Yeah. And then, then like, things like uh, this year's Maiden uh, from Siren. Yep. I had more of a hand in the barrel blending of that. It was in my first week of working there. And suddenly you've got your own kind of, I've seen behind the scenes. And then when you get to drink the final product, you have far more of excitement about it and an appreciation for it. Because ultimately some of the decisions we made in blending came out of some of the things I'd put forward, which was nice. So I got sat, sat there going like, yeah, I can taste that barrel that went in there. I can taste that little percent of something that on its own was not very palatable, but really Together. balanced it out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I really... Um, enjoyed that beer slowly and sort of felt every part of the development that I was able to take part in and and yeah oh brilliant and um, what's the perfect place for you to enjoy a beer would you say I mean I probably I, I enjoy beer with friends 
first and foremost. That, that's what it's for. But for me personally, and this isn't true for a lot of people, but the perfect place to enjoy a beer is when you pull it through on the tap, either in the cellar or behind the bar, before it's gone on, before the public get their lips on it. Because if it's really, really good, you go like, we're about to unleash this and I can't wait to see what the reaction is. Mm. There's that little bit of anticipation. You're, you're down in the cellar and you crack, you know, or you crack a can of something after it's had its conditioning time and you go like, people are going to love this and I, th- I, I can't wait. You know, I can't wait to make people... Like you're in on a secret before everyone else knows and you get to yeah. share it with them. Yeah, and you know, when you're having the opportunity to taste beer out of the bright tank once it's carbonated before it gets canned and you go like, this is the freshest it can possibly be. Uh, obviously, that's great for some styles. Not great for other ones that, that need aging. Yeah. But even so, yeah, that little bit of anticipation before it hits the masses. Um, and it's, it's not like... I know you said it's like you're in on a secret, but it's the anticipation of making people happy. You go, we've done a good job here, and people are going to be happy when they drink this. Maybe it's, more like you've got good news to share. That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. That sense that you... You know when you walk into a room and you do have some really good news, non-beer related, yeah. you're excited to share it? It's that exact... That whatever, that, whatever that feeling is. Sort of yeah, fizz. when you're kind yeah. of fizzing, yeah. with, and you go like, guess what, everyone? You've won the lottery, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, are you, what are you most excited about in beer? One of the things I'm excited about the most in beer at the moment is that we're seeing more attention giving to the traditional producers that are still going. Mm-hmm. So on other podcasts I listen to, I've been listening with intent to the breweries like Schlenkeler, this, you know, smoke beer in Bamberg and yeah. stuff, and all of their old timey ways of, of continuing their tradition. And it's just, it's just really nice that, that we have those things to talk about. Because in a world where you're constantly pushing for the new thing, it's easy to forget the old thing. But the old thing is only still going because it's great. <laughs> it's really, yeah. really good product. It stood the test of time. That's literally. exactly it. So I, I like that there's more attention on that sort of thing. The, the notion of craft beer as it arrived in the UK, I, I feel like I've, I was kind of of drinking age when people started using the word craft beer. But that came over from America and in my opinion, it started to mean in beers influenced by the American trend of mm-hmm. brewing. And there ended up with a bit of a harsh line being drawn between traditional producers in the UK and craft beer producers to the point where a customer would come in and go, what sort of beer do you make? Is it trad or craft? And I see that line starting to disappear now because, I mean, let's, let's face it, making a really well-kept traditional cask ale is, if anything, more of a craft than banging a load of dry hops into a cylindrical conical tank. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's, the word is expanding. People's appreciation of those styles is expanding and becoming less divisive, which I like. Have there been any people that you'd say have been particularly instrumental in your career? Uh, aside from the people who uh, em- employed me, of which I'm very grateful. I think I've now met so many brewers and producers in the industry that it wouldn't be fair to single out a single person and say like, oh, you really did it for me. Mm. So I guess I would have to go back to my original friendship group uh, that are out there. You know, do, I mean, some of them work in brewing still, some of them don't. Um, because without them, I wouldn't have had that little spark and wouldn't have had friends to talk to about it and we wouldn't have spent lots of nights brewing and drinking beer together. So I don't know where I'd be now without, without that group. And as we come to the end of the podcast, are there any ways that people can follow you and stay up to date with things, JD and Siren? Yeah, so you can find us on Instagram at Siren Craft Brew. Uh, I'm not sure what the handles are for there. I can pop those ones in the show notes. I'll also pop in the details. This should be coming out in December, so we should have Fire and Stars, and I'll pop a link to that if it's uh, hopefully still in stock. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. Uh, For my own personal benefit, (laughs) I'm sure the sales team would say that they want it run out. Um, You can find me personally um, on Instagram at jd.bruise. And on there, it's just a mix of things that I I do. It's It's not all about brewing, if anything. There's more pictures of me running around um pumpkin carving recently i did a bit i saw of, that one yeah, yeah. very intricate and detailed but, yeah. you, you know i was saying about 
going down the rabbit hole and getting interested in something. I've, I carve a pumpkin every year, always have, but you see the really special ones and go like, well, how do they do that then? Oh, a Dremel, right, yes. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I stayed up until one in the morning carving pumpkins because wow. I just got fixated on it. Yeah, and it's my, all just playing. My wife's like, come to bed, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, thankfully, <laughs> the sound of a Dremel on like pewter is, is like the sound of a um, dentist drill. Yeah. But on a pumpkin, it's quite quiet. It's just spinning That's away, right, yeah. churning away at pumpkin flesh. Yeah, gradually shading through different layers of pumpkin. Yeah, I, mean, I don't the, sac, the, the sleep. I don't get enough sleep anyway. Yeah. With with the little one, um, but I, I, for some stupid reason, I, I still try and reach out and sacrifice it further um, for the sake of <laughs> in, in for a penny, in for a pound. On your Instagram, I also saw a few clips of you with your accordion. Yeah. As well, so perhaps another hobby that you're sort of going in to learn all about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I picked that up when uh, I was lucky enough to inherit one. I think I started playing it when I was about 18 or so. I came from a background of playing piano uh, before that, so I had the piano side of it figured out. Uh, you just turn it on its side. Yeah. But then the buttons and the bellows, they were a new thing. Yeah, they, I don't have as much opportunity to practice and get better at it than I, than I used to. So every now and then, whenever I have the the rare few and far between free day, uh, I spend a couple of hours playing. And hopefully, if I can play sort of once a month at home alone, then I can prevent my what I have learned from disappearing. Yeah. So that's I'm in uh, I'm in a holding pattern at the moment <laughs> with uh, with the accordion playing. Now I did ask JD to bring his accordion with him to the pub, as you do. So stay tuned to hear him play. And right now, let's talk about spruce. Can you tell us about spruce trees? Yeah. And how you got into brewing with those? Yeah. So always in the pursuit of the uh, a different ingredient, something that somebody wasn't using, uh, I used to leaf through the back pages of some of the, like lots of homebrew books, they'll give you all of your I- IPA recipes and bitter recipes and stuff, and then they reserve the chapter for weird stuff at the back. And so you'd look, uh, there was one called The Joy of Homebrewing, can't remember what edition it was, but by Charlie uh, Papazian, and he had a, like a one-pager on spruce beer, some notes on it, and I just thought, well, that's really interesting, like you're flavouring a beer with something that wasn't hops, or, or trying to balance it with something hops. And he described the flavour that he got out of brewing sp- with spruce as cola-like in a evergreen kind of woody sort of way, mm. almost like dandelion and burdock, traditional, rooty. I don't want to say piney. I always resist saying piney because it's, it's not a pine tree, it's a spruce tree, but I'll get to this next bit in a minute. It contains lots of pinene, that, that, that terpene, which yep. is why it smells the way it does. Yeah, it's a real fine line, isn't it? Or yeah. it's a sliding scale you yeah. can get for those between terpene and yeah. cola or orange yeah, sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I was reading this book and I just looked out the window and we had one tree in our garden when I was at university, I was sharing a house with those same friends. We all end up living together for some strange reason. It was quite a funny story. <laughs> and uh, it looked right. And I was like, okay, let's read up on spruce trees and see if I can get it identified. Sure enough, it was a spruce tree. I was brewing spruce beer that very weekend because by, by the grace of somebody up there, uh, I had seen that page at exactly the right picking season and had ingredients to brew a pale beer. So brewed that. And I have a really strong memory in my mind. We used to invite friends over uh, to share the beers that we made because you can't just make, you know, gallons and gallons and gallons of beer and drink it between four of you. Unfortunately. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, we used to invite our neighbours over and things like that and, and have, have parties for our friends. Mm. And it was just a nice, sunny kind of summer evening because that's when your spruce beer you made in the spring is kind of at its best. And I was just sat under the tree, not talking to anybody or engaging with anybody because it was shady and they were all in the sun. And you just look across the group and you see them all drinking spruce beer. And I've got a glass of it in my hand. And you sort of look up at the tree. And I did something stupid, which I still do now, which is just give, like, cheers the tree. And I did that on my own and nobody was watching. Um, yeah, so that's a really powerful memory of, like, facilitating a good time yeah. and doing something a little bit interesting. And I uh, just introduced all those people to a flavour they'd not come across before. And it tasted great. So when I had my interview at Wild Weather, Mike asked me, if you could brew one beer, what would it be, like commercially? And I said, spruce beer. And he's like, oh, God. (laughs) I thought you were going to give us the golden nugget. (laughs) At least 
at least you were open at the start. So he knew what he was getting into at that yeah. point. Yeah, and he's like, well, what do you have to do to make that then? Yeah. I was like, well, you have to pick lots of little bits off, off an evergreen tree at exactly the right time of year. They don't weigh very much, but you probably need loads to make a commercial batch. And he's like, this is not the golden egg. <laughs> this is not the golden egg. But in we, we did, in the end, brew a batch of that. And I needed help to pick it because... Uh, it is so labour intense. The very first batch we picked with just three of us, Mike, Matt and myself, uh, and that was just enough to make sort of a half size batch. And then I thought, well, there we go. It's worked. It's sold out. People have enjoyed it. I've got my little kick from making a commercial spruce beer, and there really aren't that many breweries doing it. Um, so the next time around, I wanted to make a full size batch, and I can't quite remember how the conversation started, but I ended up making friends with Darren at RAB, Reading Amateur Brewers, and we saw a mutual benefit in having volunteers from RAB come out for a bit of a tasting session at Wild Weather, a picking session uh, out in the forest where I could make use of their sort of free labour, <laughs> <laughs> and the opportunity to share what I had learned about spruce trees and, well, you pick spruce tips um, at the point where they begin growing. Um, and, yeah, you, you share that information and you make a day of it. You take a couple of beers out into the woods... With with the permission of the forestry manager, it all has to be done above board. Yeah. You're still it's almost like you're taking out a school trip as well. You're you're looking after a group, you're responsible for them, and you take them back and have a few beers. Then the beer gets released and you all get to do that thing where you sit down and go like, Cheers, trees. Like yeah. that that's that was good. And I have to say, I it probably is my my favorite, if you want to call it an achievement, my favorite thing I've done so far is making that connection with RAB and having that because that trip then grew and grew and grew until we had like 25 or 30 members out. And you're in that picture, aren't you? I am the big one where we sat down at the, yeah, the, it, the forest track. It almost yeah. looks like a, like a full team football team photo. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but we're all out in the forest and we've all got our malt sacks full of spruce tips. As you do. Yeah, and it just turned, in, it's turned into a day that, that everybody looks forward to. So to have that effect and to have that influence on other people and... and win them over to being interested in something that I thought only I was interested in, mm. to the point where, independently of me spearheading it, you know, they were doing a BJCP-sanctioned spruce spear competition, a national competition, um, where you had entries coming in from all over the place, as well as the RAB members. Mm. And judging that, I just sat down and thought, like, how did I get here? Yeah. Like, what a, what a cool good. thing to be sat in a room full of other now spruce spear enthusiasts. It, you know, I don't work for Wild Weather anymore. Uh, and so we were lucky enough that the forest that we got the trees from was just behind us. We, we, with the help of the forestry manager, he highlighted some trees that he wouldn't mind us picking from. And they were all together on their own and not used for forestry um, operations. So they weren't for, for logging or stuff like that. Siren is a bit of a different thing. It's a much bigger kit and you'd need a lot more to do it. And I'm not saying that it's a no, but I'm yet to convince the powers that be, that this is what I, we should do or that I'd like to do. I would love to do one. I, re I really would. And I don't know, like, it was very sad when I left Wild Weather because I, I didn't want to see it go in the way that it did. Mm. But then one of the sort of things that buoyed me up a lot is that Darren got in touch with me from RAB and said, like, well, you're not at Wild Weather anymore, but all of the members are saying, are we still going out on our yearly spruce trip to pick? I said, well, we're not doing a commercial beer this year so how about we just take a couple of beers out into the woods we'll get permission again um but we only pick what we need for home brewing um and so that's what we did and i think we'll probably do it again next year and the year after that Definitely, it's yeah. uh it's yeah obviously this is a podcast there's no video but i'm kind of beaming right now thinking about it it's a really nice memory that that the group wanted to bring me back to to lead that I, I always call it an expedition. It's just a walk through the woods with a few tins of beer. <laughs> That's all right. We have backpacks. <laughs> yeah, and the weather's always been kind of favourable for us, but we, yeah, it's... One, one day, it's going to absolutely pee it down and everyone's going to hate it. <laughs> yeah, I think you've been blessed with good weather so far. Yeah, indeed. we have, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that's another example of facilitating good times, right? And it's a two-way street. Yeah. Um, and if you zoom in, yes, those people for some reason are going into the woods and picking uh, the spruce tips, mm. but they're doing it together. They're learning stuff. They're doing something brand new, you know, and, and all that. And it's good that it's gone back the other way, I yeah. think. And 
everyone's it, everyone's it enjoying it and i love your phrase cheers to the trees yeah yeah that's it's a silly thing that i almost was reluctant to say because it's it's an embarrassing thing to do to to raise a glass and literally t touch it to the tree and but, go like cheers mate <laughs> well so i think we can say we owe trees a lot anyway yeah we do yeah yeah mate yeah it will be spruce aside yeah. we, owe them a lot. <laughs> we do that's not a controversial opinion of mine but yeah, I think we'll draw to a close on that. So thank you very much again for your time, uh, for, for joining us on the podcast. It's been fascinating to hear everything from you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, like I said, thank, thanks so much again for the in invitation and the, the opportunity to share, albeit in a very one-sided way. A classic podcast. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Well. Cheers. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>